What is your freedom worth to you? Each of our guests had a light bulb moment. They longed to live rather than merely exist. They smashed through their fears and programmed minds, trusting themselves, their faith and their survival instincts. Leaving the guilt, fear, oppression and drudgery of their past. For a brighter future. They took a brave and courageous step into Freedom This is their story of how they got a life Welcome to Get a Life Podcast, Excult Conversations You matter and so does your story Welcome back to Get a Life Podcast, X Cult Conversations. We are here today with Carmen and a very special guest, Julie Fletcher. Um, Julie was also in the Brethren, the Exclusive Brethren, now known as the Plymouth Brethren Christian Church. And like most ex members, still suffers and has the roller coaster effect that we all do. And I'm going to hand the mic over to Julie and let her tell her story and what she has been through um, post leaving the Plymouth Brethren Christian Church. So welcome, Julie. We are very, very blessed to have you come on to our podcast and share your story. I know your story is going to send ripple effects, not only through the ex-member community, but inside there, it is a story that I know you are such a wholeheartedly wear your heart on the sleeve kind of person that yeah. when we have those types of guests on here, it, we all feel it. We all feel it. And I know the ex brother community has been very much holding space for you as you have gone through horrific tragedy recently. And I just want to know that we are holding space for you on here for you to be able to share what you're willing to share. So I'm going to hand the mic over to you. Well, thank you, Cheryl. It's um, I feel privileged to be joining you and Carmen too. And, and it's uh, nice to have a commonality with each other. Um, yeah. I was born in Vancouver. Uh, my grandparents, uh, my dad's parents had moved to um, Canada in 1956 um so that was a huge move for my family um and then uh my my brother anthony he was five he was killed in a car accident in vancouver um and my mother was pregnant with me at the time and um so a little bit about that um it, i think it was a friday night and they my mother and anthony were going to stay at home from meeting and then at the last minute anthony decided to go to meeting with my father and um and he just said bye mom and he went off and on the way home my dad stopped um on southeast marine drive um it's like a elevated slanted road and um he stopped to get a newspaper left my two brothers in the car and um the car rolled uh, my my younger brother bob well he's older than me but the younger of the two he pulled it down into neutral and the car rolled down towards a bridge uh, and a truck coming off the bridge or heading east hit my da- my dad's vehicle broadside and anthony was thrown th- through the windshield um and so my mom was like wondering what happened and where they were because they hadn't come home yet and then the police showed up at the house and said, well, like you're needed at the hospital. And so she called my grandmother and, um, had my grandmother meet her at the hospital. And then she told me that, um, they'd asked to see my brothers and they weren't allowed to, and we don't know exactly why, but so I was, I come out into the world like six months later and I'm like born into all this grief and misery and pain and all sorts of stuff. And, and my mother was just never able to 
form a bond with me because she had just shut down. So that affected my life um, right off the bat. Um, and then, um, you know, my parents would always fight and argue and shout at each other. Um, we were never allowed to have brethren over to our home because our home was in my dad's eyes, never good enough. Um, so that, wow. you know, made us sort of m marginalized already. Um, and he would get angry with my mother for not doing anything during the day, which wasn't true. Um, he just didn't see it. Um, so that, you know, played a huge role in our, my brother and my life. Um, I remember one time I was down in the basement with my brother and we, he was, my dad had come in the house and was shouting at my mother and, and, um, my brother and I said, like, we got to do something about this and they can't keep going on like this. And we went up the stairs and we just shouted at the two of them. You two need to cut it out right now. Um, oh. and that was caught up like the end of that, um, and so, like, by the time I was nine, um, we came to Victoria, um, and I didn't know what had happened, but I found out after, since I've left, what happened. Um, but I was left on the ferry um, with the brethren, and my parents decided to go home. But I just walked off the ferry got on the bus, went to the meeting room, sat down. And I remember thinking to myself, walking off the ferry, like, where's my parents? I can't find my parents. I haven't seen them. I don't know if anybody else has, but nobody said anything to me. I hadn't even seen my brother. Um, nobody had sat down with me and talked to me about what was happening. Um, I had no idea. And like I said, many I hadn't known for many, many years, and it um, was just always a major issue for me. Um, and I just sat down in the meeting room and John Borum came up to me and just said, you're going to the box house, which is another family and the brethren. Mm -hmm. And, and I don't even remember like getting off the ferry, coming home or going to the box house that night, anything. It's just like a blur. Um, but I was there at the box house for like two years and oh, I had wow. no contact with my mother. Um, I couldn't write to her, talk to her, see her gather any of my own belongings um nothing i remember one time i was walking to school when i was living at the bucks house and i, I crossed like main street which is a very busy road in vancouver um it has a huge land divider of grass and so i would cross one side and then stop on this big huge land divider and wait to cross on the other side and my mother my brother had gone to live back with my mother because he couldn't handled being with the box um so my mom had dropped him off at school and on her way back um then she saw me and she was just panicking and said no i gotta let you i gotta cross with you and i was very adamant that she not do that but <clears throat> she helped me cross and i went off to school and um I continued living with the Bucks. Um, and then when she got her separation from my father mm -hmm. and ultimately her divorce, then she came back to meeting. And uh, I remember her coming into meeting, sitting down beside me and pinching my butt. And I didn't understand why, you know, like that's a, a, a nice, hi, how are you? Wow. Um, great to see you. Um, <clears throat> so anyways, um, my relationship was even more strained after that. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, yeah, it's it's never been a great relationship, but it just was even far worse. Um, and so we moved to Richmond, and we lived in um, my cousin Nairn McAfee's house. Um, a lot of brethren don't know that Alan and Stuart are my mother's um, second cousins. Hmm. Um, their grand, their grandmother and my great grandfather are siblings. Interesting. Oh, so well, I didn't that's know how that. we're, yeah, that's how we're related. Um, but we always called, um, Stuart and Alan, like uncle, uncle and aunt. And so, um, we lived in Naren's house and, um, then eventually my mom and I and my brother all ended up working for Jason, which is Naren's older brother. And, <clears throat> Um, eventually we were able to buy a house 
that used to be long to first David and Yvonne Borm and then Steve and Glennis Todd. And but in order for my mom to be able to afford it, we had to move it forward on the property. And then um, Doreen Bellamy bought the property between us and David and Yvonne. And so there was our house, Doreen's house, David and Yvonne's house, and, and a meeting room. A gotcha. small meeting room. Yeah. So um so we lived there um, you know, for for until I left the brethren, which was in two thousand. Um and how old were you when you left? Twenty. Okay. Yeah. Um, stuff was always kind of rough, just little things that occurred I didn't like. Um, first, my mom, you know, would we had like this small fence that would kind of hide our a shed that was behind, and it was just like the top of. The, our driveway i don't even know why it was there but anyways um she wanted it painted and she would say oh i gotta get bob to paint this and and i said to her you know he's never gonna do it he doesn't have time and if you just get the paint i'll do it and uh so i painted it and then i decided i would paint a little deck that we had off the side of our house um and i i never got any recognition no thanks um nothing from my mother um actually my brother gave me a, a compliment which was shocking to me anyways because he was always kind of you know just nasty just yeah. want to be nasty towards me um not really want to get along um so I'm trying to think of the next thing that happened um i guess would be me leaving you know um and what was I your know, like, what was your what was the light bulb that made you know you needed to get out like, what was the driving factor? Um, well, I had this ongoing question floating around my head, and and I don't even like, I don't, I didn't understand where it was coming from. Um, and I remember asking, telling my mother about it, and um, she just said, "Oh, that's the devil." Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I, my question that was floating around my head was what if there's a church out there who preaches the truth and you miss the rapture yeah. because you're in a church <laughs> that doesn't preach the truth or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. and I really thought nothing of it to begin with, but, um, because it never really left me, um, then I had to give it some credence like, well, yeah, what if? Yeah. So. I don't know. And, and then the, uh, just little things I'd have to back up a bit. Like there had been a situation with Dave and Yvonne Borm's oldest son, Mark, he has mental health issues and he had called some family in Barbados um, because he'd heard voices telling him that I needed to marry some guy in Barbados. I can't even remember his name. Um, and he believed it so much that he called the family and told them. And I got wind of this uh, wow. actually through mark todd mark todd came and told me and he was like you know mark is telling alice my cousin alice mcafee that you're supposed to marry some guy in barbados um and i'm like what like that's that's weird um and i don't even know this person i've never been to barbados but apparently he had stayed with his family and so he knew them but mm -hmm. um i went home that night and told my mom about it and she didn't believe me she thought I was full of crap. And I was like, oh, well, you know, like it all comes out in the wash in the end, her famous saying. And um, so a few nights later, Yvonne shows up at our house knocking on the door and she goes out to talk to her. She actually asked my mom to go outside and talk to her. And my mom came back in after 20 minutes, say, and uh, my mother said nothing. And I just said, mm, so what's all the seeky seeky about? Oh, well, it has nothing to do with you. Okay, excuse me. Um, so I said, hmm, I'm going to find out one way or the other. And sure enough, like maybe a day or two later, she's up talking to her sister in England, telling my, her sister about what had happened. 
that Mark had done this. And so the parents found out about it and had to call the family back and say, sorry, you know, our son's mentally ill and, you know, just disregard that. But she never wow. said, you know, I'm so sorry for not believing you. I, you know, I apologize. You know, I should have just listened to you. nothing. And she never even talked about it. Wow. So um, just a lot of little things. I just was tired of the way we were being treated. I felt like we were, you know, marginalized. You know, we were um, minimized. We were nobodies, um, you know, because I felt like I was being targeted because I came from a broken home. And Uncle Al was kind of leading at the time. And, and if I sat beside him often on a Saturday. Um, and so he'd call me after the meeting and say, why weren't you at meeting? And I mean, he wasn't nasty about it, but um, I said, yeah, I was at meeting. I sit behind you, remember? <laughs> this was like a common conversation he, he and I would have. And he's like, well, I didn't see you. And I'm like, yeah, because I'm sitting behind you. <laughs> yeah. So, of course, you're not going to see me. Um, but I'm like, did you call up, like, Stephen and Glennis and find out when Tawny, why Tawny wasn't there? Or, like, um, Graham and Carol and find out why Marianne wasn't there? I don't think so. I, you know, you're just targeting us because I come from a broken home and I happen to be like a family member. So, yeah, it was just just frustrating to me, you know, to be targeted all the time. I was I felt mistreated in the um, when the brethren took all of us out of public school and put us into this uh, like distance learning yeah. program. They had like their study hall. And I would complete my schoolwork the way it was supposed to be completed, but of course it took longer. All the other kids would just do their send-in papers, which meant they did it faster. Yeah. So they would like haul me aside and, Julie, why don't you do this, this, and this, and this? I'm like, I'm doing it the way I'm supposed to. Yeah. And you're talking too much? I'm like, no, they're talking too much. I do my schoolwork. I mean, I was behind, but, you know, like I was doing it the correct way and you know, just little things. It just irritated me. So I just had enough, frankly. I just had enough. And so, I don't know, out of the blue, I decided to jump out my window at one o'clock in the morning and take off. So, wow. <laughs> yeah. And did you I, have a plan? Did you have a plan? Or no. was, it was just, wow, good for you. And no, no plan. I had no, well, well, I shouldn't say I had no plan. I had some sort of a plan, but, you know, like it was, running away to somebody's house that I really didn't know, like a worldly man's house. Mm -hmm. um, and my plan wasn't really planned out well, because when I got the taxi, so initially I jumped out my room, took off, I hid um, at a t uh, telephone booth. Um, and then I decided to walk up the main drag from our house, like the main street where our house came off of. And I went into a Mac store, which is like a 7-Eleven type store. And I asked to use the telephone book. Um, but I don't think they had one. Or maybe they did. I can't remember. But somehow I was I managed to get a taxi. And I asked the taxi to take me all the way out to Guilford in Surrey, which is a mall. And um, he said, I can't drop you off at the mall because it's closed now. So where am I going to take you? And I said, well, I don't know, like, um, I don't have a phone to use. I don't know how to get a hold of Ray. And he's like, well, here, you can use my cell phone. So I tried getting a hold of Ray and he didn't answer, but eventually he did. And so he ended up dropping me off at Ray's house and I stayed there. And, and then the process of uh, looking for my grandfather began because uh -huh. I had never met my grandfather, my father's dad. So I... Um, phone i got got out the phone book and looked through all the frank fletchers and i was like okay i'm just gonna have to call every single one of them wow because i had no idea where he lived um and i'm like well i need to come up with a, a question i'm gonna ask to narrow my search down which was like <laughs> do you have a daughter named Susie?" um and so literally called them all and uh, my grandfather was the very last one. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So wow. it was pretty amazing to meet meet up with him. And um, the minute he saw me, he's like, you look like Audrey. You look so much like Audrey, like my grandmother. And I said, yes, yes, I do. 
<laughs> I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but I mean, she's dear to me. So, yeah. Um, yeah, just instantaneous. Um, I felt right at home. That was my grandpa. Uh, and if, unfortunately, he was involved in another cult. And I was totally not aware of that. But um, he's like, well, you can't stay here at Ray's house because, you know, that's he's so still very brethren in his thinking. Yeah. That's, you know, living in sin. You can't live like that. That's not OK. So you're coming to live with me. So here I am. And I'm like, well, at least, you know, leave some money for Ray, you know, because he didn't harm me. He didn't hurt me. He didn't. He treated me OK. Um, so. Um, went off to my grandfather's house and lived with him, um, went to college and I worked and ended up going to church with him. Well, he, he really talked me into it cause I really didn't want to, um, because of all the things that brethren have yeah. always told us, you know, like, well, you know, they, uh, live double, double standards, you know, they go to church wearing dresses and then go home and wear pants and. Actually, I found out, like, maybe that's true, but they're actually more genuine Christian than the brethren are. Yeah. Isn't so, that amazing? <laughs> yeah. But needless to say, they were a lot like the brethren. They wear dresses. They have long hair. They're not allowed to wear makeup or jewelry. Um, they have to be, you know, in submission and... So, you know, a lot of similarities. My grandfather would still have folks over to his home on a Sunday. Occasionally, not every Sunday, but um, they had, you know, uh, special meetings. And so I would go um, to special meetings with my grandfather. And um, we drove all across the states um, down to um, Tennessee and eventually to Georgia Wow. And that, that was awesome. That was an awesome um, adventure. And I and I was thinking, you know, we're just going to have the typical old story of a flat tire. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 of course. We had a way more original story. Um, I had a map and I had figured out which exit we needed to take. And so I was looking for one that goes like up over like a bridge that goes up over the highway. And uh, my grandfather takes this right turn. And it just goes sort of like down a country road with like a, a cement barrier in between the lanes. And I said, Grandpa, like, we're totally going the wrong direction. This is not where we're supposed to be going. And he's like, no, Julie, this is the way we're going. And that's it. I'm like, okay, <laughs> mm -hmm, sure. Let's just see how long this lasts. Um, so we're just going along. He goes, see, you see, it's got a divided highway. It's got this concrete barrier in the center. I'm like, no, Grandpa. It doesn't mean like that. But, you know, we're just going to carry on because you know what you're doing. Um, so he's like, the end, the barrier all of a sudden ends. And out of nowhere, he goes, Julie, I think you're right. I think we went the wrong direction. How do we get back? <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, Grandpa, like seriously, you just turn around and go back. It's like <laughs> not that hard. <laughs> so um, we turn around, we go back. I said, okay, get back onto the freeway. You have to carry on about a mile or so and you'll see the exit, exit 81 or whatever it was. I don't know. Um, and it should be like it goes up over the freeway because we're, we need to go east. So sure enough, we found it and we get off. We got going and um we stopped in several places where there was message believers um and that was interesting you know like staying at people's homes it, you know there are so many similarities to that and the brethren and so, so do you think, was this an offshoot of the brethren like was this an offshoot of people that had left maybe at aberdeen or no it was just no no it's oh. completely different it's um um, they're known as Branhamites or um, message believers. They believe okay. that God sent a prophet um, and he was preaching like uh, just after the war. And he's sort of like a he's he he was very like mixed up, shall we say. Um, a lot of things that he told were plagiarized, um, made up and you know, just a bunch of crap. Not even yeah. true. Yeah. Um, 
he he was he'd started preaching in the Baptist church and then because he believed in um you know faith healing and that he moved on to preach with Pentecostals and then eventually he just went out on his own um preaching in tents having tent revivals and that kind of stuff but um a lot of their beliefs are based on this one um so-called vision that he's seen that is not even true never even mm. happened mm. and you know that it, everything uh, since leaving you know there's men and people that have looked into things that he said um you know pointed out that he honestly was very you know talking out of both sides of his mouth one mo moment he was like um don't you believe me to be god's prophet and the next minute he's saying you know if i'm a false prophet put the sign over my body and i'll wear it through town and um wow you know just all sorts yeah. of stuff and um so i yeah i didn't really want to get involved in church but i ended up going with my grandfather i ended up getting baptized because he was like pushy about it and um i would sleep in the hallways because i didn't understand what was being talked about i didn't really understand like william branham or his ministry or what yeah. was being said it was just uh it was like listening to another language wow. so strange um once i started reading the books that were put out then I was like, oh, yeah, you know, this is the truth. And I finally found the bride. And wow. I mean, now I look back and say, my gosh, my grandfather went from one brainwashing situation to another. Yeah. yeah. And it's so sad. Like, you know, it happens so often. Yeah. You know, I guess I'm just glad I got out, you know, and I think, I think it's because of me having my children. Um, so, okay, so like William Branham's father was part of the KKK. So this influenced part of his ministry where he'd say, you know, you should never have mulatto children. You should never want to be in a uh, mixed race marriage, blah, 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 blah. Um, that always irritated me because to me, I don't really see the problem with it. If you love who you love. Exactly. And, you know, it's only skin deep. We're all children of God at the end yeah. of the day. Yeah. Um, so, but because my children were biracial and because i had them out of wedlock you know i was also no longer allowed to sing in the choir i was no longer allowed to help out in the church um and so i just quit going and i was working as a care aide um at night um prior to her being born so i kind of just you know quit going because i was working and i didn't have the time and and then she was born i'd go visit and you know they would say nasty stuff to me and um and just like, well, I don't want to go. And then I found out there was like a huge split in the church. I don't know exactly what year it was, um, but it would be like about 10, 15 years ago. Maybe not 15, but 10. Um, the pastor's daughter had been sexually assaulting her son's friend. And he was very young when this was happening. Um and I, I was just so shocked because I had trusted her and, and had confidence in her and looked up to her and to find out that she'd been doing something that was actually criminal in my book um, and allowed to continue playing the piano and conducting the choir and doing all these things. And I'm like, really? Like, you guys are so hypocritical. Like, why would you allow her, who's committed a crime, a crime and should be behind prison or in prison behind bars for this and i am not allowed to sing or do anything i'm just nobody now it was just pure hypocrisy um so i really wanted nothing to do with the church after that um i did when i was in grand prairie go to visit the church up there um but i really had nothing to do with it you know um I, I just said to my grandfather, I'll never step foot in your church again. And I, I never did. I didn't even make it to his funeral. Unfortunately, I couldn't afford to go over there. So, <clears throat> yeah. So, um, since leaving all of that, um, I've, you know, I've got myself into a domestic violence relationship. Um, 
And I remember thinking some part of that was normal. Um, and then realizing it's not normal. Like I, it's only normal because I've been abused in in the past, but it's not acceptable and I need to get out. And I remember telling myself, if you can leave the brethren, then you can leave this situation. The only difference is you have children now and all the more reason to leave. Um, and it took me four tries to get out wow. of that situation. And um, then after that, I had a lot of health problems where my body actually attacked itself and has created like this tunnel um, leading up to just above my pelvic floor, which needs to be repaired. And I've had like umpteen surgeries, MRIs, CAT scans, this and that and the other. And it's just ridiculous. Um, what else has happened? Um, do you find, do you find that like we often see this with um, female ex brethren that when, because in the brethren, the submission that a female has to go through and what they witness in their own parents, right? And witness in could be siblings that are married or witness right in there do you find when when you left and you got yourself into a domestic violence situation that mm -hmm. your normal way of reacting would you say that was because of what you had witnessed and gone through growing up and what you witnessed probably in yeah probably i just didn't want to like i realized i need to walk on eggshells which is a very common theme in mm -hmm. you know with women that are in dv situations um they got to be very cautious and careful what they do and what they say and you know just everything and i do think it I, I actually i have attributed all of my situations with my kids dads and any of the men that i've ever been with due to my non-relationship with my father and yeah. It yeah. not being good not a good um you know no good role model for me yeah yeah um not having um been told i was worth anything not beautiful not smart um you know no recognition no acknowledgement you know no love and would you feel like you were viewed as just this object in the brethren versus a being that needed that love and that care and that compassion and the nurturing mm. i mean i definitely remember thinking that i was simple-minded mm -hmm. and then coming to the realization that actually i was perfectly normal yeah i was like wow why did i ever think that i was actually like mentally or incapable or like i don't know but i just yeah i don't know it's just um uh, I guess I do in a way feel like I was an object. I, w I was just there. Yeah. Yeah. And, because, and my parents are my parents, but they're not really parents. If that makes sense. Yeah. Like they're not, I had no motherly uh, relationship, no fatherly relationship really at all. So sorry. And you know to what, the I, and I want to say to the viewers and listeners, we know that this stuff goes on everywhere in the outside world, but it's different when you're in a closed community and that closed community is supposed to represent this tight knit family that looks out for each other. You shouldn't have, like in your case, Julie, when you, like, you, there should have been always someone being able to give you that nurture, the care, the compassion that you were needing if your parents, yeah. could it, right? So that's what I really want to, we do get that often of, of people saying, well, you know, this stuff goes on everywhere. We know that. But when you are a community that is set up, and you're saying that this stuff doesn't happen in there and this stuff that we were, everybody is taken care of, then in a situation like yours, Julie, you should have all, there should have always been someone there that was ready to give you a hug, that was ready to be a listening ear, that was ready to just wrap you up in whatever you needed. Yeah. Well, and be a, um, um, a mentor or, you know, somebody to look up to. You know, just say, this is how life should be. And, and this is what you should expect from somebody of the opposite sex and what you don't accept. And, you know. Yeah. When so, you look back and you think about that ferry ride and you think, I mean, I, I think that's probably the point where you sort of feel like your whole life changed. Definitely. You know? All of a sudden 
you are in Victoria and your parents, your brother's not there. Nobody explains to you what's going on. Um, the only thing you get told is you're going to go live with the Bucks. Right. Um, and how do you, you know, looking back, how do you in your mind resolve that situation? You've been jerked out of your parents' home. You've been placed in a different home. And and like you say, it wasn't like a loving, nurturing environment. It's not like you went and lived with grandparents who would obviously, you know, take take over that role. Do you yeah. think that's well, I would be placed of- with cousins, like relatives of my mother. Like again, that should have like I guess that was because they didn't know that Alan and Pearl or Stuart and Evelyn were relatives of my mom, but there's so many things that should have happened that didn't like a, they should have sat me down and told me what was happening, explained it to me. You know, this is what, what happened. There was an occurrence downstairs with your parents. Um, and so how I've been able to resolve it is by going back and asking my parents, well, what in the world happened? Yeah. Yeah. That was one thing. And so they, I had to get both of their versions because I knew they wouldn't be the same for the most part they were, but there was a small portion where it was different. So my dad said that um, my parents had told us that we needed to stay within eyesight, which was pretty normal. We usually did anyways. So all the brethren would sit in one area and um, my brother disappeared and they couldn't find him. And when they realized they couldn't see him, that, my mom said to my dad, well, you better go find him. And my dad's like, no, you better go find him. Like the typical argument starts. And so they decide to go together and he's downstairs the next floor down watching people play arcade games. And my dad just lost it. He grabbed him here um, by his shirt and threw him up against the wall and just lost his temper. And that embarrassed my mother. And so I guess this is why they decided to turn back, but I don't know. My dad says they came back upstairs and saw Bill and John talking. <clears throat> and so approached them and asked them to take me and my brother. Um, whereas my mom said that um, Bill and John decided that they we, we would t- be taken. Which, in my mind, sounds more accurate because probably yeah. word got around. And, you know, with them being the leaders, they decided amongst themselves that we weren't in a safe situation and we needed to be removed. Um And one thing I forgot to mention is that um, my brother and I were um, asked to write letters to our father saying that we didn't want to see him anymore. Um, But my letter was written for me. And then I was just assigned it. Wow. How old would you have been? um, 12. That's just so not. And see, right there, (laughs) um, right there is the ultimate damage turning a child against a parent and Mm -hmm. and the 12 year old child knows that she did not write that letter. Um, and, and even your brother forcing him to write it, I'm sure they coached him what to say, because that's how that stuff worked. You have terminated (laughs) that, that father, daughter, that father, son link. Um, And then once you've terminated it as a, a normal church, you would step up and take responsibility to make sure that those people had that nurturing, that fatherly guiding. And from mm-hmm. what you're saying, you never felt that again. Yeah, there was, I mean, cause of course, I guess normally we would have been with grandparents, but because my grandfather was out of the brethren um, since the seventies, we couldn't go live with my grandmother. Yeah. Even though my great grandfather was, well, he was there, but I think he was in a care home at that point. So, um, but yeah, you know, like there's so many things that should have happened that didn't. So and you, I don't and know. You, when you think about it, if you think of a group of people and um, like there's that scripture when, when one sheep out of a hundred goes off or is hurt or is lame or whatever, you drop the 99 and go take care of that one. And yeah. you look at a situation like yours, and um, with the two of you, you they should have been taking more care of you because yeah. you had more concerns. You needed more guidance. You needed that fatherly care. Um, and this is the this is the problem that I have with that whole system. It's it's arbitrary. It takes you out of your parents' home without even you know without even input from you, and then destroyed that father daughter father son link. 
instead of trying to help it or repair it or 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 take over and replace it nothing yeah. is done and that that's that's where that's a huge issue to me mm -hmm. yeah and i would say that that it would be because of that like my dad came to visit one time and they i guess bill and liz knew that my dad was coming to visit or to see me and so they had me busy doing stuff like unloading the dishwasher i don't doing a bunch of stuff in the kitchen until he arrived and by the time he got there i just remember opening the door and i'm like hi dad i don't want to talk to you boom slam the door yeah so you know that kind of i have nothing to i mean i really didn't because he was our abuser yeah um um i i i was in a way grateful that he was gone yeah but that's so messed up like you know yeah. to not be allowed to have some sort of a, a relationship and and i think it's really um affected me like well both of us because i still don't have a relationship with my father i i really don't i mean but it's my choice now yeah yeah, yeah. exactly yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but you can see so, how it's probably affected you all the way down. You know, getting into the domestic violence. Definitely. Again, you know that studies show that is a product of not a proper father daughter bond. Yeah, absolutely. You know? Yeah. There's just no doubt. You can't. You you have to look back and say, this is what really the root cause of what has happened to you. Absolutely, hundred percent. I know this is why. Um, I was looking for love, acceptance, um, to be long in some way and just looking for it in the wrong ways. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thankfully, I've been able to work on my ancestry, which has helped me find relatives and family that I never knew. You know, even family that were used to be in the Brethren and left. And I would never have known that until I found them. Wow. So, huh. Yeah, I, I, f I found a fourth cousin through my ancestry, and he looks so much like my brother and I that we would be like four first cousins, not fourth cousins. <laughs> um, you know, the same big forehead, square cheekbone, high cheek uh, or square jawline and, and high cheekbone, um, even wears glasses, um, <laughs> and like, you know, likes photography and music like I do. And yeah, he looks exactly like us. It's crazy. That's cool. <laughs> yeah and through him i found i think second cousins once removed so their father their grandfather and my great grandfather were brothers and yeah. so one of them actually sent me a picture of my great great grandparents who i'd never seen and i was like wow, wow. that's amazing wow so wow. it's it's fu it's fun um my mom's side my grandfather was born in the open brethren um so i i talked to doug engel which he has like the brethren yeah. wikipedia yeah or brethren pedia rather um and he lists all the open brethren meetings and whatnot so i've had a few conversations with him and he did tell me who to talk to and it, like to try to find out more about my grandfather but yeah it's all very interesting <clears throat> i did my dna and um so that was we squashed a, a long time story <laughs> that ended up not being true that's cool <clears throat> but so i'm 52 percent scottish and the rest is viking english oh, and viking I love it. <laughs> oh. so and i told my uncle brian my dad's brother and he's like yeah well don't you know your grandmother was a shield maiden i'm like you talk <laughs> Wow. <laughs> no wonder you can persevere through all the crap that's been thrown at you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then, and then Haven was just like, wow. Yeah. Wow. That's like, that's, that is, um, the, the, I mean, the icing on the top of the cake on the wrong and the wrong side of the way, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like the wrong way. Yeah. Oh. Wow. It's, uh, I, I, yeah. I know that it's my faith that has helped me through that. Yeah. You know, I, I've, I don't attend church now, but, um, I will listen to church services online. Um, 
I love listening to my um, Brooklyn Tabernacle choir or, or, you know, gospel, reggae gospel or something like that. Um, and it helps me through, you know, this tough time. So, yeah. so we should just, in, for those that don't know um, our viewers and listeners, are you able to do, are you up to telling the viewers and listeners what happened to your daughter? Sure. Um, so Haven was born uh, premature and born after a miscarriage. So she was a rainbow baby. Um, she was born at 35 weeks and one day. So she looked two months early and she weighed three pounds, 14 ounces. Um, she was born by emergency cesarean. Um, I had a really horrible um, pregnancy with her, unfortunately. Um, so, um, and because of my um, my body attacking itself, I was still having issues with my own health and on heavy drugs for the pain. Um, so they were worried that she would be born, you know, um, not addicted, but, you know, yeah. reliant on that. But thankfully, I hadn't been on it long enough for it to affect her. Um, so she was in the NICU for like two weeks. She breathed and fed very well, like on her own. Um, she just needed to gain weight, really. Um, so she came home two weeks later and she was still like under i think under five pounds just wow. teensy weetsy people thought i was carrying a doll yeah <laughs> um i remember when you posted pictures of her she was she was so little and so adorable <laughs> yeah she was precious just beautiful and just uh full of life you know because of her adhd she just was always on the go always talking always singing always dancing and so, thank God for the Wiggles. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I know every Wiggles song there is. Uh, <laughs> I um, about the Wiggles. <laughs> so, when then she started school, the doctor, her, my pediatrician, or her pediatrician, decided to put her on uh, medication for her ADHD. And it started to be okay. Like, she was doing well. And then I didn't think it was working, so I took her off, and it seemed to just... Um, the teacher said, well, she's not doing so well um, with her writing and so forth. So I said, okay, well, I'll put her back on. But actually, that was probably, looking back now, when she got the start of the tumor. Oh. So, And we had noticed things for at least a month prior to her actual diagnosis. And I had taken her to the emergency to see a doctor there, and he just swept it under the rug no it's just her adhd you know this is common with kids with adhd you know their balance isn't great i'm like this is beyond not normal like yeah you know what is, is expected of them it's beyond that like and so i even took her to the pediatrician and he was not convinced either and i'm like really what does it take to get you wow. people to listen and so then we started seeing her eyes cross and i decided that i would book an appointment for her eyes to be tested and the same day um i end up booking an appointment with my pediatrician so the teacher well actually she's an occupational therapist said to me julie have you like been noticing these changes with haven and i said yep yeah, like, I know, I see her eyes that are crossed, I see the way she's looking, and I know that she's been falling a lot, and um, I have her, you know, booked for an eye appointment. She goes, no, I think, you know, you need to get this looked at a little bit more. I said, hey, you know, I have tried, so would you mind, like, writing a letter so that you, I can have that sent to my pediatrician? And she's like, yeah, sure, just, you know, sign this waiver, and I said, sure, no problem. Sign the waiver, she sends it off to the pediatrician, and I get this appointment with him and so he actually had the letter in hand when um i was on the phone with him and i was at work that day and he goes you need to take her to the hospital right now wow. so we went from the eye appointment to the hospital and um they really didn't do anything locally they sent us down to victoria and we did a cat scan there and they came back and told me that she had a um, brain tumor in the pons area of her brain stem. So in the central nervous system, yeah. um, known as DIPG, uh, diffuse intrinsic uh, pontine glioma. It's uh, quite common in children, like between one and five. Sometimes kids older get it, but 
that's more rare. Um, so the lifespan is about, you know, six to 12 months. Um, anyways, we got transferred to children's hospital. We were airlifted by air ambulance. So she kind of got one of her wishes to go on an airplane. <laughs> um, and um, she fell asleep and we stayed there. I don't know exactly how long we were there, maybe a week at the most. And then I came back. Um, they, they talked about, you know, my options which was radiation um they don't do biopsies because of where it's where it is in the brain doing it could actually do more damage Mm -hmm. um and they don't do operations they don't remove it um so radiation was really the only option and i was initially going down that route um and they were trying to book um a time for her to go in and get what they call a mask made for for her um because they have to put this mask on them so they can isolate the area where they want to target with the radiation because it's so specific. Um, And um, it just wasn't going to work out because I said, no, you know, I need to be home um, to be there for Kyra because she's graduating from elementary school. And I promised her I would be there and I'm not going to back down on my promise. Um, So, I said, you know, if you can try to arrange a time after that, that would be great. But I was annoyed because the doctors and um, the various doctors and I were not communicating. Like, it just gone right out the window. So, I got frustrated and I just said, you know what? I don't want to do this. Um, I have a good friend that has kind of taken me under his wing and treated me like a, a daughter locally here. And... Um, he, he has studied psychology, like groups, different types of groups of, um, people. And he's also, um, counseled at the Victoria hospice. So he just said, you know, I've seen what radiation and, and chemo does to families. And it's, it's just not a pretty picture. And I said, well, I just don't want to grieve twice because I'm grieving now. And then hypothetically speaking, I get, you know, give her the radiation. Ultimately, she's still going to die. So then I'm back to square one and we're grieving again. So I just, and I had to think about my kids too. And I just thought like, I knew the doctors were saying to to me because of her ADHD and you have to be really still when getting radiation. It meant that they'd have to sedate her every day for six weeks. Wow. Um, and I'm like, no, I saw what the radi- or the, the sedation did while you guys did an MRI. She barely woke up. It took forever. And that scared me. And I said, no, I'm not willing to put her through that, uh, you know, sedation every day uh, for six weeks. That's just. That's ridiculous. Cool. Yeah. No, I'm not going to be terrified every day. Yeah. And I have to think about my other kids. They it would mean that they wouldn't be able to be with me. And so I said, no, I think I'm just gonna go check out Canuck Place, which is the hospice. And they are more about quantity or quality of life, giving, you know, them memories to think about and rather than quantity. Yeah. And that was what I wanted for Haven and for us, you know, to make memories and for her to be um free from pain as much as possible and just to go peacefully and, and, and let her be with God. Yeah. So, um, you know, it was ups and downs or we were there at Canuck place for two weeks while they, you know, sorted out her meds and got a baseline of what she's like. And, um, then we had, they got her on, um, morphine. And so she seemed like she was, quite happy and in a a place where we could come home. So we came home for six days and then she got a chest infection and fever. Um, And by this time I had nurses coming in to visit to check on her regularly. And they decided that we need to go back to Canuck place. So because she was considered palliative, they made space for me immediately. And I said to um, the nurses, well, next time we go home, Haven won't be coming with us. This is it. She's going to die here. And they said, well, we don't know that. I said, I'm telling you, that's what's going to happen. 
because I'm a sensitive and I can pick up on things. And um, so I said, you know, um, my brother was killed on July 27th. So I have my day, my eyes on the 27th. And they said, well, she might have her own day. I said, yeah, she might, but it's going to be there or thereabouts. And the Monday prior to that, we went out to um, North Vancouver and she had like a huge blowout on the way home. And that's usually when we see the tumor progressing. She would have these out outbursts of behavior and just not able to explain what's wrong, you know, that she's in terrible pain or whatever the case is. Um, and then the nurses sat down with us that night and said, you know, based on the changes we've seen with her, because she's having trouble swallowing at this point, um, and her voice was weak. I mean, weaker. We could still hear her, but we'd have to like listen quite carefully. Um, and she was very aware that she was losing her voice. Um, she said, based on these changes, she's most likely not going to be able to communicate with you much longer. And one of her requests is that you s sleep with her, and stay in the room. And I said, okay, well, we haven't really wanted to because it seems like we agitate her more, but you know, I will stay with her. And thank God I did because the next morning I wake up, went into the bathroom, come back. She's awake. And I went and said, good morning to her, went to the side of her bed and she just grabbed my hand. And I, then I start seeing that she's struggling to breathe. And I said, mommy needs to call the nurse. And so I was turning to go and she just grabbed my hand. No, 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 I don't want you going. She didn't say anything, but yeah, I just, knew she didn't want me to leave. So I said, well, I'll call, I'll use the call bell. And, um, got the nurse to come in. I said, look, she's struggling to breathe right now. You know, it seems like we never really got rid of that, um, raspiness from the, um, infection. <clears throat> and, um, so they gave her oxygen and a fan and medication. And, and I was able to call the girls down and, and they said hi to her. And then she went unconscious Wow. And she was unconscious for four days until she passed. And we just watched the breathing decline like three. I think it started with like five breaths and a pause. And then um, that would be like that day, maybe the next day. And then later that the next evening, she was like down to four breaths and a pause. And it just slowly decreased over time until she just, you know, the breathing was so bad it, i actually had to leave the room at one point because i was just so distraught and i just couldn't handle it um so i went upstairs to where me and the girls were sleeping and of course i had called papa ron over and the girls were in her room and then i texted kyra my 13 year old you know how's haven is there had been any changes and she just said well the nurse says that she's not going to be here much longer um, so I said, okay, I'm going to come. So I went back downstairs and I called my friend um, from my grandfather's church, Faith. And so her and her daughter, Janessa, showed up um, from Maple Ridge. And um, actually, you know, I've been keeping my eye on Haven quite well, but uh, Faith distracted me. She wanted to show me some song or something. And in the next minute, Faith looked and she goes, oh, I think she stopped breathing. And I turned and I said, yeah, she has, she's, she's gone. So we called the nurse and, um, Kyra and Janessa were just having a conversation. So they didn't even pick up on what had happened. I had to, um, tell Kyra like two or three times, sorry, she's gone. You know, she's gone. That's it. And Kyra just burst in tears. She's like, I've lost my little sister. So I said, she'll always be your little sister, you know, it's because she's not here doesn't mean that she's not your little sister still. Yeah. Um, or that she's not your little sister anymore. Um, but I understood what, you know, what she was feeling. The grief. Yeah. 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 Wow. So, and she's very uh, emotional. You know, she's a, she's a very outgoing, um, bubbly 
butterfly type person. She's got a lot of friends and involved in a lot of things. And she's, um, she's strong, strong minded. Um, and she tells me what she thinks. <laughs> Whereas <laughs> Kaylee is very reserved and quiet and, yeah. um, very resilient like honestly i don't think i've seen her shed one tear yeah it's so. amazing how kids are so different you know yeah yeah for sure yeah I, I don't think that it you know i think it does still affect her but she has you know just delved into her her arts and and the things that she likes to do which is drawing and coloring and she's yeah. very artistic well, and it's amazing each kid takes it different or or goes through it at a different time too, you know? Like yeah. some kids it takes them a little while to to really start to heal from it, you know? Yeah, for sure. So Wow. Yeah. You've been through so much, Julie. So much. Yeah. Yeah. So much. <laughs> That's why um, I say I'm just waiting for the next bad thing to happen. Yeah, uh, and that's kind of what I wanted to just jump into. Like, post leaving the brethren and going through everything you've been through, like, what do you find? What do you find are the lingering <clears throat> psychological results of being in a cult like we were in? Trauma, panic attacks, um, anxiety, depression, um, just what I call like snapping at people, like just getting, um, it, it could be just somebody saying something to me and I just, you know, break down in tears and, um, I have to explain to them, like, you know, not all disabilities are visible to your eye. Yes. Some things are not seen. And, um, you know, I technically have PTSD. I would say I actually have complex post-traumatic stress disorder. Yes. So those are, you know, and relationship issues still. Um, in terms of work, like I'm able to work. Um, but, you know, like. I never know when something will trigger me. And it's sometimes completely unexpected. So, yeah. I do find my the CBD helps. I've I've been put back on like a medication for the depression. Yeah. Um, because I said to my doctor, like I've had depression before this happened, but this is just like another layer to it. Mm -hmm. Um, so it just you know doesn't help. That's a lot on your plate, though, right? Like you deserve mm -hmm. to be on an antidepressant after what you've been through. Yeah. I think it's helping. Like it's hard to say as of right now because I've only been on it for maybe a week. Um, but I think it at least takes the edge off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So thankfully, yeah. I'm still able to find, you know, joy in some things like my music and my my crafts and stuff like that. I've been taking to uh, making some earrings lately. <laughs> I saw those earrings. Yeah. I'm gonna post a picture on here. They're gorgeous. Thanks. Yeah. yeah, I made more and um Kyra made some for her friends. Um Kaylee makes uh, bracelets or necklaces for herself, but I think she could probably make, you know, stuff for others and sell them. Um I'm working on I worked on one gem art that says um we have somebody in heaven, so we have a piece of heaven in our home or something to that effect. Yeah, yeah that saying, yeah. yeah. Wow. And um now I'm working on like uh chickens <laughs> i love um a french country home so and now it, you know going back to my dna it all kind of makes sense why i like what i like so <laughs> yeah wow yeah so yeah i would say those are the main things that from leaving the brethren are are you know just don't go away things that i you know um I have struggles with like stupid things like going to church and seeing men wearing shorts and I'm like, that's not okay. Or um, I remember going to a um, Pentecostal church and it's more like not so strict, but she was wearing, I think Minnie Mouse or Mickey Mouse. Um, 
or what like reading the scriptures on their phones like little things like that that are just so trivial and you know it's like I don't know. It, you know it just yeah. it frustrates me makes me mad and and i'm like why what like i actually question myself as to those things like why does that frustrate you why does that make you mad like why can't you just it, it it's not about how you come to church it's you just come as you are you know the scriptures like so i try to reason with myself and i'm very analytical um and i think that's actually helped me to change actually who i am or was rather yeah so i'm more open-minded um as ron says you're conservative yet open-minded but not open-minded enough for your brain to fall out <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's fun. yeah <laughs> so that's good yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh that's a good one <laughs> yeah. wow okay i'm going to share some pictures here you've sent some pictures to us and we're going to walk through them sure so this was the first one that i shared earlier this is sure favorite. my brother anthony sitting on the stairs of the house um he was five and the little teddy bear slash mouse was actually one of my favorite stuffies which i lost somewhere along the line <laughs> um but we lived in this house until i was five years old um i think i sent you another picture of the house yeah, um, just go through it might not be the next one it might not be um no. there's my my two brothers again anthony is in the red and bob is in the gray mm -hmm. and they were like sorry yeah oh, not i think 13 back. or 14 months apart so that's okay you can carry on yeah <laughs> close in age very close in age always into trouble um <laughs> this was a trip from school um going to the um, parliament buildings in victoria so there's myself and Ruth Ballard and Janie Borum and Lori Ballard. And so um, Janie's sister, Rachel, is Lori and Ruth's mother. So she's their aunt. <laughs> and we're dressed in brethren attire. This is my mom and my grandparents on my mom's side, my brother Bob and myself. This is at the airport in Richmond. <laughs> and they'd come and visit often from um, England. And your, your mom looks a lot like her mom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. And the typical yeah. attire that the brethren wore back then. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. There's the house that we lived in till I was five. Um, the stairs were Anthony sitting. Um, back then the house was white, but the next owners painted it. And it, it actually doesn't stand anymore. There's another house there. So I cherish that picture. <laughs> Aww. yeah yeah it looks like a little dollhouse <laughs> yeah very quaint. this is the second house that we lived in um we hated the color of it but we ended up you know loving it but um i think i was about seven or eight here and um we grew this um huge um what do you call it? sunflower and uh my mom's like, look how big it is. Stand beside and we'll take a picture. And then we were off to, to meeting. Uh, I think it was Sunday morning or something. Huh. Yeah, you've got the scarf on. You got that. Everybody had the little curls like that. Yeah. <laughs> Jerry curls. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's myself in the back. And Trenton um, Gracie, who is deaf, and my mom. Uh -huh. Wow. Uh, my myself uh, my brother behind me and then my cousins trevor and norman um, who live in portland oregon and we would spend a lot of time at my auntie Susie's house that's deanna and me my cousin um we would be um confused for each other you know especially from the back because we looked the same and you can see that yeah eventually yeah. i grew taller and then on, at one point we both had glasses and then Deanna decided that she'd go with contacts. And so that was sort of like the one thing that differentiated us. So she had no glasses and I had glasses, but I still got confused. Like people would say, Oh, hi Deanna from the back. And then they turn around and was like, Oh, <laughs> you um, yeah, she lives in um, Ohio and she has five children. She's still in the brethren. Mm. Wow. She married Denny Southard. 
Um, so uh, Southern's a very prominent family in the Brethren. Yeah. Wow. That those pictures were so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't really changed much, hey. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. fun to look back like that <laughs> yeah when you when you see this movement taken off that's happening all over like in your personal opinion like what would you what do you hope to see out of all of this i was just you know i'd love to see the brethren just not be a thing yeah <laughs> yeah i'd love them to to I'd love them to, to know the truth, actually. Yeah. You know, and to be able to have the blinders taken off their eyes and to actually see it from our perspective, yeah, from the outside perspective. And do you feel that there's an accountability that needs to happen from the past? No, like not at all. Like I know John was made accountable for what happened to um, our family and to... Um, another family, I probably shouldn't mention names, um, but, and, and he was made to actually like sit back, lose his position, mm -hmm. apologize, blah, blah, blah. But to me, that was, you know, it was just like, well, means nothing. Why don't you come and apologize to my face and actually know what you did? Mm -hmm. the, yeah. the decisions that you made, how it affected my life personally. Yeah. 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 I think that's what I mean. Like, do you think that they... Like, in my personal opinion, it's like cleaning up the past needs to be done a little bit different than what they've done, right? That sure. the amount of suffering that a lot of survivors and ex-members have gone through, I don't think they've even touched the ripple effects that that has happened upon. No, because they're still in denial. Our children. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And they're still in denial. Oh, we didn't do that. We don't do that. Uh, you are such liars. Why don't you just tell the truth? You know, like I, you see it in so many different religions. Like you see it with the Catholics mm -hmm. and the priests that have, you know, hurt so many young boys. Well, we don't want to talk about that. It didn't happen. We're just going to sweep it under the rug. That's not the freaking answer. Yeah. Yeah. Like I know it makes you look bad, but let's deal with reality. And this is one of my issues with Doug. Like he doesn't want to talk about all the stuff that's happened within the brethren. He just wants to talk about the good part of the brethren. I'm like, but that that gives the wrong impression to somebody coming from the outside who sees it from the outside. And it makes them look like they're good people. But that's not reality. Yeah. Yeah. You have to talk about the ugly stuff. And, and I'm glad that the ugly stuff gets talked about in, in terms of the brethren and in terms of the message believers. Because, you know, they want to put on this facade. And I just say, you know, they're fake um frauds and full of shit yeah 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 because they you know they see me and, and they'd see me because i was living in langley where all the brethren have moved to and i lived amongst them for quite a while even while i was out and one day i, I was on the streets and craig and linda were taking a, a walk craig borum and and linda fraser and she she's a very devout brethren um don't rock the boat you know at all and so um she just said you know we're thinking of you julie and i'm like oh please just take your <laughs> crap elsewhere like you don't you would not say that you wouldn't actually i think she might have said you were praying for you and i was like you wouldn't even say that if you didn't see me it's so not real it's you're just just it's shut facade. it down yeah it's yeah. just the facade that they they just don't out. talk to me yeah yeah yeah. Do you have any relationship with your mom at all? Has she reached out at all? She she did reach out um, because, well, I actually reached out to my brother first, but he didn't. Oh, you muted yourself, love. <laughs> Old, um, Peter and uh, Peter and Pat. I think it was Peter and Pat. And um, I talked to Pat um or was it Drunter? I can't remember. I called somebody in the brethren and told them that I would like a message sent to my mother that Haven had passed away or that she was sick and, and then eventually that she'd passed away. I was able to tell her later. Um so 
my mom did call me when I was at Canuck Place, and it wasn't, uh, I mean, it started off okay, like, she was, she's always, like, on the surface, we don't ever talk about anything, like, deep, no yeah. deep conversations, it's always, like, you know, oh, yeah, well, I know what you're going through, you know, because Stephen had breathing problems, and I'm, like, who are you talking about? Well, my brother, Stephen, I'm, like, oh, okay, I didn't understand who you were talking about, and, um, so, and then she, she moved on to talk about, um, how the doctors had treated her because she had, um, breast cancer and they had said, you know, that they could do, um, different treatments and it meant going like, um, uh, I think radiation, of course it means going into like this MRI type machine and she just can't, she's very claustrophobic. Mm -hmm. Um, so she's like, well, I won't be able to do that. Um, so they, they said, well, okay, that's fine. And so she's explained to me how they were very understanding and really good with her. And, um, <laughs> like, you know, this, this has become about you. Yeah. Um, yeah, and when you needed her to hold space for you at that moment. Yeah. But I, I already knew that I couldn't expect anything from her because the truth is she never had help. Or counseling for the death of my brother. Yeah. So how could I expect her to give me any kind of advice, um, understanding, uh, empathy, compassion, anything? I can't. Like, um, I remember Dr. Phil saying, uh, you can't expect anything from somebody that they're not able to give. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, that's what it is. She can't actually give me love. And so there's no point in seeking for it from her she's incapable of giving it to me yeah. and and it still shows today um i've had another conversation with her since um because she didn't know haven had passed but I, I had texted some number i guess it wasn't hers i don't know um but it always it always leads to well you know you're not where you belong yeah and I, I i just said to her like i'm sorry but i i just don't agree with you about that you know, we have different ideas. And I said, everybody's been given free will to make choices in life. And then you have to live with the consequences of those decisions. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I made my choice and you made yours and that's fine. We don't have to agree. But, you know, the brethren's idea is like, it's our way or it's no way at all. You're just going to go to hell. Yeah. Um, but I just, I so desperately would love her to see that it doesn't have to be like that. Yeah. Yeah. And things that happen, like it being raised where we were raised, things that happen that are bad, they were tended to be portrayed to us as punitive. And yep. God is not punitive. Bad right. things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people. And really, it's how you come out on the other end of it that shows whether, you know, whether it's a win or not. It's really, really hard and it's going to take you a long time. But in the long run, you'll be able to look back and say, I've grown from this. For sure. Um, that Viking warrior in you is just emerging. Yeah. Yeah. For yeah. Sure. Oh, yeah. Tough cookie. Definitely. And it all oh, makes sense. But why it doesn't I... make it any easier. Right. No. And that's what I think people need to understand is that, you know, sometimes you've just when you've been given the plate that you've been given right sometimes you just want someone to take that plate for you for just a little bit so that you can breathe sleep and replenish a bit right for sure yeah i mean we might be strong but even the strong have moments of weakness exactly absolutely so um and it's interesting you say that carmen because she she said well you know like maybe you should uh think about what god's trying to tell you from this situation and I'm like, you know, what difference does it make? You know, something bad happened to you. My brother was killed in a car accident and you were in the brethren. Yeah. Did did that mean that you were out of God's will? Or exactly. you know, it's doing so sin? Important. Yeah. Like and here I am on the outside. Bad stuff happens to us on the outside too. Like yeah. it, it you know, it's yeah. Life is, is everywhere. Not, God is well, not a punishment, God. Yeah. That's not what he does to us. And yeah. she's like, well, you know, I, you, you have no idea what God has done for me in my life. And I said, and you don't know what God has done for me in my life. Right. You, you know, she's right. trying to um, say that God is not doing anything for me. 
like that God's not even in my life anymore, that I've just given up on God, that I, you know, thrown away my faith, that I'm just going to hell and I'm going the way of the world. But in truth, actually, because I left the brethren, I got saved. I actually have a relationship with the Lord that I never would have even dreamed of having. Yeah. And, and it's not that I would judge her, but had she, um, gotten good out of it she would be display like you can you can tell someone who has gained something by the fruits of it and had she yeah. gained something from it her compassion her understanding her ability to embrace you when you're in that position would have showed yeah and that's sure. not what you're describing to me well no know? because like i said she wasn't even able to uh get help for her own loss yeah yeah so yeah, it's going to affect her and she's not going to be able to, to help me during or through mine. So, yeah. yeah. And, and, oh my, talking about my dad, you know, I had told my uncle Brian and, and, um, he, he wanted me to tell my father and I said, no, I don't want to talk to my father. And I really don't want to tell him because Haven died the next day after my brother's death anniversary. Like, how bad is that? Call my dad up and say, oh, yeah, by the way, Haven passed away and she died the day after Anthony. And this this um, accident has affected both my dad and my brother since it happened. Like, they're... Um, mm -hmm. In my my father is what you call a closet alcoholic. He He likes to hide his alcohol in, like, ginger ale or something like that and um my brother i don't know what he's like now but i know that he's had his issues with drinking and for sure so it affects them negatively and and so anyways my uncle brian suggested that i write a letter to my father and so i was going to do that and i just said fine i'll just call him um and tell him but i, I told him straight up i really don't want to tell you this but because i i know it's just gonna lead to you drinking and please don't drink, Dad. Please don't go and drink because of this happening. And he's a narcissist, right? So immediately when when I tell him that Haven passed away, he's like, oh, well, did she ever get the COVID shot? You know, because I said, no, she never had the COVID shot. She was too young. But he's always looking to blame something or someone. Um, and I said, no, my other kids had the the shots and they're perfectly fine. She has a brain tumor. It's not even remotely connected. So there's a typical narcissist. And again, you know, going back to my DV, through being in that situation, that person was a narcissist. And I think through learning about narcissism and being able to recognize those flags, I realized my father is too. And then that's kind of why I don't want you know, he does the same thing. Any conversations are always about him. So I just like, you know what? It's, it's, uh, I realized talking to my mother, it was a trigger in a negative way. And I just prefer not to have further communications with her, either, either of my parents. Yeah. So. Wow. Yeah. Then, you know, you have to make, make certain boundaries to survive. Yeah. 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 Well, you, you learn, um, what is healthy and what's not healthy yeah. yes and they're yeah. not healthy and i don't need triggers in my life i my my father actually tried to throw me down the stairs um in calgary um because i refused to listen to him talk against my mother and um after that happened i just never really i never trusted him again i'm like i'm never leaving my kids in your care i don't want you around me i don't want you hurting my children um this cycle must stop here. Yeah. Yeah. So. Hmm. Well, yeah. and I think you need to be really proud of yourself that you have stood up and said, this is not going to continue for the next generation. Yeah. No, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And I've said that to my kids, like, I want you to be better than I, I am. And I was, I want you to have um, choices that I didn't have. Yeah. Um, I want you to, um, make decisions for yourself you know very soon because you're coming into like my oldest is 16 she needs to start making choices for herself now you know what's she going to do for school what does she want to because i'd suggested graphic arts but i think she wants to actually go into um acting 
like into drama and stuff. And I'm like, oh, are you going to go to Broadway, Kaylee? She's like, yeah, maybe. <laughs> I'm like, oh, well, you go, girl. Yeah, yeah. That's, and that's, that's the beautiful, beautiful thing of coming out, right? And being able to gift your children freedom. Yeah. Well, freedom and the support that um, we didn't have as as exactly. brethren. Um, you know, we didn't get support from our parents to do anything, you know, to have choices, to make decisions, um, to want anything. Yeah. You know, good for ourselves. So, um, and Kyra, she, she wants to follow in my footsteps um into the healthcare and i said well if you want to go into healthcare you'd be a nurse you go big or go home girl <laughs> <laughs> i mean care aids are, are needed but yeah. nurses is where it's at because there's so many more opportunities as a nurse so true, true. yeah wow uh well thank you so much we really appreciate you coming on here and pouring your heart out so soon after losing your precious daughter um, thanks I think every survivor that comes on here and gives a piece of their life, what it was like inside and post really inspires and helps those inside. Everybody inside finds a piece of themselves in every story that is told. So we are very, very grateful yeah. of you yeah. coming on here. Um, yeah. Is there anything that you would like to add? No, I just want to say thank you to to you and to Carmen and for your support. I, I know Carmen understands, um, yeah, you know, on a personal level because I know she's experienced loss, um, you know, and and only parents that have lost a child understand what that's like. One hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. and I'm there anytime. You shoot me. A Thanks, Carmen. <laughs> Appreciate it. Appreciate it. You guys are wonderful. Yeah. Uh, thank you for giving everybody a platform to speak. You know, it's um, not always easy to come forward and speak up, but it needs to be done. And, and I'm so proud of everybody that has, especially you, Cheryl. I'm proud of you. Thank you for. And I'm proud of you for coming speaking on your truth, love. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's hard, but it's you know it is. We we're seeing the results of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Julie, for pouring your heart out to us all. And until next time, everyone. Take care. Much love to everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. If you are in a high-demand religious group and need help, please go to alloflief.network. To share your story or be a guest on the show, email info.getalife at proton.me. Please remember to like this video, subscribe to get a life and comment.